15th of February uh, 2020, a Saturday, we were privileged enough to be going through the doors of the Society of Antiquaries in off Piccadilly in London to attend the Prehistoric Society Landscapes of the Dead conference. And mm. this is us reporting back, or rather having a discussion between us about yes. what went on on the day. Yeah. Yes, it's, uh, it's an interesting one because... Uh, we're just talking about this, that uh, so many of the talks, there's so much research being done, and these are massive research projects that each of these speakers, so much compressed into one day, that they've condensed everything down to give you the bare bones of the information. So you can then go and, uh, uh, and research it uh, or look further into it if you want to afterwards. Mm. So we're really, we're going to be giving you what we brought away from it. Anyway, <coughs> as far as we yeah, can. I think you can bring your chair a little bit, bit there, maybe slap towards the edge, I think that, that'll be fine. Uh, oh, and something I didn't do, and that's introduce, just in case you thought this was a stuffed uh, animal or uh, some <laughs> toy or other, this is uh, like of a dog. <laughs> he may move about during the next uh, hour or so, who knows. Anyway. Yes, totally untrained. <laughs> <laughs> I blame the parents. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Anyway, <coughs> so um, yeah, like you were saying, so rather than uh, rather than a report, it's more of a discussion. Yeah, it's because it's so uh, very interesting actually how we each picked up hmm. different things, um, you know, from each of the speakers. It's amazing how our notes are not all the same. <laughs> it's intriguing. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, the important things that we take from certain speakers, you know, they can be quite different. And so, yes, we'll try and get that across. And I think if any of you have uh, watched through our report from Sunrise Over the Stones, uh, we'll last, year. last year we'll detect a bit of a, a, a difference and I think that's probably because of the quality of uh, I, don't, I don't mean uh, in a judgmental way but the qualities of the talk because uh, the day was a bit truncated because there was a storm and the, you know the, that's the, true there were some transport difficulties so everybody was uh, it started late yeah. and it finished early because some people were going to have trouble getting home. And everybody so. was remarkably good to, at keeping to the, the time scale. And I think the thing was because this is a special, the sunrise over the stones was a bit more general. Mm -hmm. And this is very particular to do with mortuary practice uh, and, uh, in, the yeah. and, and the early Bronze Age, mm. that the papers presented were considerably more refined. Mm. Uh, in, in their subject matter than mm. what was going on at sunrise uh, the, the stone so um, it's a it's a quite a, it's a different context uh, and yeah. and we found ourselves sort of having to catch up because we are not in the club we're not archaeologists ourselves mm. so we've got this thing of we don't quite understand some of the contexts in which the papers were being presented yes so that's true yeah that said there's still loads of stuff to convey to you um, mm. and, uh, and, and many observations from the day I'll tell you one of the things that really yeah. impressed me actually and it's something that that occurred right the way throughout the day that I've never actually seen quite so rigorously at any other conference I've attended on any subject and that was the mutual respect amongst mm. uh, the archaeologists who not one person sought to go over their allotted time by so much as a minute. <laughs> it was quite extraordinary. People flicking through sides at the end, no, 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 we'll just go to the thanks very much screen. Um, and that does actually say a lot. If, you know, if any of you have been to conferences where people just don't care that they were supposed to finish 10 minutes ago, they just carry right on going. Yes, indeed, mm. correct. Anyway, um, should you rush through what the subject matters were? Yeah, the, go on. Uh, Individuals. I haven't got the uh, the thing in front of me. So I'm gonna... Do you want the actual piece of paper? Oh, I've got the actual piece of paper. There. I was going to refer to the screen there. So, um, kicking off proceedings was uh, <coughs> um, um, prof uh, sorry, Rick Peterson, uh, University of Lancaster, uh, early Neolithic early Neolithic human remains in caves. Hmm. 
and the origins of multi-stage burial. Second up, uh, Dawn Cansfield, University of Winchester, diverse burial practice in early Neolithic southeast England with an archaeophonological <laughs> reconsideration of burial <laughs> positions. You see what I mean about it getting a bit refined? Archaeophonological, yes. Well done. Did you actually say the word? Archaeophonological. Archaeophonological. Now, explain. What does that word mean? This is a good new word time. It is a new word for us, but um, well, and probably for. Um, uh, <laughs> do you know what? I don't even remember because it relates to taphonomy, but um, which taphonomy is uh, the study of how well, things, things decay, decay and break um, down. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, but uh, <coughs> archaeothanatological reconsideration of burial positions. Yeah, that's with consideration to how uh, bodies. Uh, break down when they decompose yeah. and uh, you know uh, the positions they end up with can depend on uh, See, uh, how you, you, decomposition. You, you can tell that um, we are quite happy to uh, tell make, you when we're ignorant. Make fools of ourselves. And, um, I'm, uh, <coughs> You're actually looking up the word right oh, now, um, live as yeah, we speak. Because <coughs> it just seems um, uh, archaeothanatology is a lesser known method in mortuary archaeology which is based on using taphonomy, that's the science of decay, to uh, infer unknowns about burial context. So you can see why we didn't really grasp that because it seems to be quite. Um, uh, it's all good stuff. Anyway, yeah. uh, we'll, come, we'll be coming back to that, obviously. Um, Colin Richards, um, and this paper was actually not presented by Colin Richards because of the weather, uh, who, uh, Colin Richards is in Orkney, yes. uh, um, University of Highlands and Islands, um, and his uh, paper was presented by uh, Vicky Cummings, um, and his paper, The Living Tomb, Fluid Fluidity and Instability of Substances. Mm. I think we're back to decay and we stuff. We are back to decay. Uh, Vicky was a good we? speaker, actually. Uh, very good, mm. yeah. Then we had lunch. Yes, we did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> after lunch, uh, Rick Schulting, isotopic approaches to landscapes of the living and the dead. Rick was great. Uh, yes, you've heard us talk about isotopes and we, uh, we, strontium we, analysis. And we and like stuff. So that, that's he's, he's the man, Rick Schulting. Back to him later. Um... The Isle of Man. We both have a soft spot from the Isle of Man. Yes. Next paper was mortuary, pr mortuary Practices and Monuments in the Neolithic of the Isle of Man Beyond the Megalithic Tombs, um, uh, presented by Chris Fowler. Next was Neolithic Grave Goods and the Complexities of Mortuary Material Culture, Duncan Garrow. He's, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a nice talk. Wasn't there much to yeah. say about that? Next, The Island in the Dark Grove. Brinketh Lee, yeah. Landscape in Context. Uh, yeah, Dr. Saren Griffiths, University of Lancashire again. Uh, Brinketh Lee is a favourite. Brinketh Lee, yes, it's, you know. we have a pet, uh, well, a very soft spot for Brinketh Lee, don't we? And, uh, <clears throat> and Saren was. Uh, yeah, yeah. And last and brilliant. by no means least, uh, Death and Burial at the Time of Stonehenge by none other than Mike Parker Pearson, mm. accompanied by Christy Willis. Yes, yes, uh, and all hail Christy Willis for the amount of work that she's done on that. Uh, uh, more of, more of <laughs> more that, that later. later. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, so starting off with um, Rick Peterson. Yes. What was the title of his? Uh, his title of his piece was uh, "Early Neolithic Human Remains in Caves and the Origins of Multi-Stage Burial." The origins of multi-stage burial. Yeah. Uh, the crux of his thing really was going from ca how how did cave burials well this is what I took from it anyway yeah. how did cave burials actually become more formalised burials yeah. or did uh, they or did or, they or, or, or was there yeah. a, a, a cut off and uh, uh, he was uh, he was using a lot of present day burial types from around the world um, as uh, well, compare and contrast, really. And there was the F the Philippines. I'd need to check my notes, but it was the Philippines, where the um, well, it was the Barra burials in Madagascar, yeah, which was complete decomposition of the body before bits are gathered up for burial. Oh yes, 
uh, and then Sagada in the Philippines, where there was decomposition and ultimately cliff burials. But the one I found particularly intriguing was the Kajere Rock Shelter in Tsavo, in Kenya, uh, where they only bury heads. So the rest of the body, what happens to the rest of the body? Uh, but they just collect the heads, and yeah. so these cave burials... When we say the word burials, we don't mean they're covered in earth. No, I mean, they're, it's just the place where you put the Maybe dead. display, it looks like they're on display. That's true, some, actually. Some, that is true. Some cases. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but making the ethnographic comparisons, it, it's, um, it, it's a large part of archaeological... Uh, research, looking at you know what parallels can be drawn. It's from a very, very difficult thing though, because if you if you look at you know archaeology generally, where uh, you're always warned about imposing your modern uh, concepts yeah. onto our ancestors, mm. and yet here is a discipline where it's considered important to look at the way things happen in uh, in the modern world, which. Uh, there does seem to be a, a touch of contradiction there. I just it? had a thought, and I think I'll park it for later, perhaps. Uh, okay. I'll bring, bring it back about that. But anyway, <coughs> it probably also should uh, should say that because this whole conference is about mortuary practices and how the dead have been dealt with in prehistory, that the difference between a primary burial, a secondary burial, and uh, repeated inhumations. Yes. Where so a primary burial is where uh, somebody is buried intact in a, in a, a tomb of whatever description. Uh, secondary burial, well, that can take various forms, can't it? It can be that uh, you uh, that you allow the body to decompose and then gather up the bits and uh, and bury them. Sometimes it's not the whole body. Mm. Uh, and then repeated inhumations, places like, uh, and I think, did Rick use Wayland Smithy as an example? Uh, where the bones have been repeatedly taken out and put back in or moved around and... Mm. Um, yes, pick the bones out of that one. Yeah, I was glad to see <laughs> Wayland, always glad to see somewhere you recognise <laughs> yes. come up on the screen. Oh, yes. Wayland Smithy! Yes. <laughs> I know where I am now. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so back to the, the, the whole thing about caves as a precursor to uh, mm. Neolithic burials as, as we know them. Mm. Now, I, I'm not going to pick through his reasoning and, or his, his process um, because that, to be fair, I don't think was committed to our, our memories. But what mm. was your uh, overall impression? And were, were you impressed by uh, the possibility of any kind of... We're talking about, really, any kind of Mesolithic activity or practice being carried over into uh, the Neolithic. Not really. <laughs> Not really, no. to be honest. Um, uh, it's it's too vague, and that's that's no criticism of, uh, of of Rick's work at all. It's just the evidence that we have. It, for me, it's very much a, well, maybe. Yeah, yeah. You know, couldn't actually see anything evidential particularly. Yeah. But there were lot. You know, having said that, there were lots of for us anyway. A, a lot of really interesting things that I I, I wasn't previously aware. For example. There was one of the rock shelters. Is it the George Rock Shelter? Was it? Yeah. Where, so. uh, where, uh, the bones that they've been finding in there, they're they're all the bones that tend to get lost or separated from the body. So, like you know, um, carpals, mesocarpals, you know, bits of finger that can drop away, things like that. And it, it it's almost as if. There is a there's a place where they have buried all the random bits that you know. So you don't know who this belonged to. <laughs> That's my interpretation. Uh, that, you know, you don't know who this bit belonged to, and so you know you stick all these random bits in this particular burial where, because that was my understanding was that that's that's all they've excavated in there is these random bits. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, the other surprise, of course, it, it to us, I didn't know there were were so many cave burials in Britain. I had in Britain, no that, that idea. Had been, no uh, idea. Excavated. 
uh, yeah, I, I've just, you know, I thought, well, cheddar, cheddar bloke. <laughs> That was, <laughs> God, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. <laughs> but you see, you know, we're, we're learning as we go. This is a good thing. <laughs> yes. But um, anybody that to listened to our podcast before last with um, Dr. Alison Sheridan will know that you know she's very much um, about the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition and basing her, a lot of her studies are to do with um, Scotland and how the uh, influ- how, how the Neolithic may have come into Scotland at the same time as it was coming into the south of England. So this uh, idea of the uh, burial practice transitioning from the Mesolithic Mm. It's actually quite at odds from the thesis of uh, the Neolithic being transformed, transported as from the northwest of, of France. The, I, that 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 would be my thing. I mean, I'm buying into the Neolithic coming from northwest France. That being the case, then the whole practice of it that kind of burial but, will have come but, along uh, from that, not been adopted from the Mesolithic. But doesn't that that's depend how, um, you know, which aspect of the Neolithic you are actually pinpointing there? Because we know that megalithic culture, the megalithic, megalithic culture, yeah, yeah. came from France. But yeah. the, but the Neolithic, as in terms of package. the use of stone, yes, the yeah. package. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, two different things, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. But uh, but no, in terms of uh, conclusion from Rick, uh, as we said, you know, yeah. maybe uh, w- uh, we 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 weren't um, lit up by that. So no. y- interesting yeah. talk, but, um, but, the, but the jury's yeah, jury's out. Kind kind of out on that. Yeah. So, shall we move move along? Yeah, go on, because okay. uh, we could talk about aspects of that. Oh, yes, we day, certainly so. could. Um, Dawn Cansfield. Uh, mm. Next, diverse burial practice in early Neolithic and southeast England with an archaeothanatological reconsideration well of done. burial positions. Wow. Mm. <laughs> Can yeah. we put that in other words? Um, her study was was the was questioning whether there was a significance to the positions uh, that bodies were interred in was which it? bodies were interred. I, will, that, I think I don't think that's quite fair because I, I don't think she uh, it was a a priori position that she was trying to use data to. Illustrate. I think that came out of the data. I mean, her study was very much, you know, an an analysis first and foremost. Mm. You know, to create a huge data set, and uh, you know, the conclusion, what she drew. It, you know, if you're doing a paper, you need to be able to present something at the end. You know, you need to present your thoughts about what that's brought up at the end. Mm. You don't start with an idea, and then go. Out to, no, to did prove. I give that impression? Yes. Hush my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, no, I mean, first and foremost, it was a study of burial positions mm. um, and practices in the s- southeast of, uh, of England based on uh, the idea that uh, the, 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 the fact that bodies de- when bodies decompose, <laughs> They go into different positions uh, depending on how they were set up in the first place. Yes. Yeah. See, I must admit that's uh, no. I might have been misunderstanding us, but that that was one of the aspects that uh, that confused me a little bit, really. Where you can have a uh, you know bodies that are interred in crouched positions in uh, in even some in in sitting positions, bound so they're in sitting positions. So the body decays and falls apart. Well, uh, how can you discern any meaningful data from something? If it, if it was interred in a, in a seated position and then it uh, decomposed and just fell to a, <coughs> a, a random pile of bone. But if you're still getting um, meaningful statistics out of uh, that seemingly random 
uh, data that point to bodies being buried in particular mm. angles, north, south, or facing mm. different ways, mm. depending on whether they're male, female, all that kind of stuff. Mm. And that, that's still coming out of yeah, uh, sure. the jumble, and yeah, it's, it's yeah. still valid. Um, so, you know, I've lost my place now. Oh, no, so here some, we are. some of the stats from Dawn's talk were pretty surprising. Well, they? we were talking about this yesterday, yeah. you know, preparing our brains to <laughs> mm. try and recount uh, this for, for you, is that, yeah, some of the stats really surprised us. Uh, about you know what? The, what? I, I think astonished. Astonished. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I was Jaws way, on four. Yeah, way more Time. than surprised. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the the region, to be clear, because Dawn's talk was specifically about southeast England. Yeah. So county wise, what were we including? I mean, because it didn't include Wiltshire, but basically. So as, in, 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 in so it didn't include Wiltshire. So it doesn't include the Stonehenge complex. You know, which which is. Uh, would possibly skew things and all of that but it does include yes. oxfordshire berkshire uh, sussex uh, kent hampshire was hampshire, hampshire yes i think so you know, so anyway yeah. southeast england yeah. you know uh yeah some of those stats percentages of burials where you find them yeah um so, so yeah, read yeah, them out yeah go on because it is just all all burials 51 known burials. N known burials. <laughs> Fifty-one percent of burials were in Long Barrows. Twenty-six percent in causeway enclosures. Six percent in round barrows. Six percent in flint mines, and uh, eleven percent in non-monumental uh, burials. So just individual so pits or whatever. Random. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, that whilst being an absolute. The fact that 26%, so a quarter of known burials uh, are in causewayed enclosures and 6% are in flint mines. I mean, what you're left... Certainly what, what we were beginning to think here, whilst to a degree it's unknowable, there's always been this thing of... Uh, so if you look at the, the impressive burial, so a long barrow, for example, there's always been this thinking that... These are the elite of the community. The special people get put in these monumental tombs and nobody knows how the common man and woman was dealt with. And, and here you have 50%, 51% are in long barrows that we know about, but only 6% are in round barrows. That makes no sense to me. 6% in round barrows... And 20, what percent? 20 what percent in causeway enclosures? 26. 26 percent in causeway enclosures. Quarter of barrels in causeway enclosures. Oh, I have to bear in mind when looking at those figures, though, that, of course, uh, <coughs> long barrow burials are multiple. Yes. So, Cauldron is in this uh, scheme, yes. being in Kent. Yes. In which there were 22 yes. burials. So, <coughs> the the... the, the the shock of those stats does uh, mediate a little bit well, when you take that into account. a teensy bit, because those figures are for actual burials. They're not for yeah. burial sites. Yeah, yeah. But I think in, the, in those figures we begin to see where the others were buried. Yeah, 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 that's the thing. And yeah. interesting. See, one of the things that, um, you know, in Rick's... Uh, the, in the first talk... Uh, with Rick Peterson, that uh, looking at modern mm. funerary practices uh, uh, amongst mm. tribal people uh, around the world, and the fact that even today, something that we've um, uh, talked about before is that, say, you know, for example, the Kogi Indians in northern Colombia, that mm. that you, they can still bury their dead in their own home. You know, it's like, well, that's where they lived. Why put them anywhere else? So they just they bury them under the floor in the, uh, of their own home. Well, if that's what was happening with so twenty six percent buried in causeway enclosures, maybe they're just burying people on their own property, or maybe. Yeah. I have to say we have to qualify uh, this because we're discussing our own takeaway. You know what we particularly noticed from 
her talk from her paper. Yes. This was not what. It's not what she was talking Hansfield about, to was, be honest. That, this was, was incidental. Saying, it's yeah. just funny how an incidental aspect of her talk was the thing that made us go, <laughs> What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, yeah, just thought uh, you ought to know that. This is us going off on one, not yeah. to what uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> she it was is. saying. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean a bonkers amount of number crunching on the uh, on the yeah. positions of bodies and all the rest of it. And just to make that, I'll just go bang through them again. Long barrows, fifty-one percent. Causeway enclosures, twenty-six percent. Round barrows, six percent. Remembering that round barrows usually are single burials. Yeah. Flint mines, six percent, and yeah. non uh, non monumental. Yeah. Uh, burials 11 yes, percent and yes it does add up to 100 percent yes it does but flint mines six percent so what somebody died on the job or the thing collapsed so they buried him where he died well, fell, maybe fell, fell down the ladder and uh, or it was that, just left uh, there. or, or is it that uh, the uh, bob was actually the foreman of the dig and mm. so yeah, don't yeah know. that's where he uh, don't know <coughs> um but uh, yeah, I mean, some ex an extraordinary amount of information on the positions of bodies in. But I do, I do yeah. think that's a dry bit of research to have yeah. done, isn't it? But uh, I was say th this is our discussion. This is yeah. saying more about us than uh, yes, it I'm, is about. I'm, uh, I'm afraid that's Ms. true. Cansfield's uh, yes. talk. Yes. Um, which to uh, get back was I th we perceived as a little bit inconclusive. I mean, she'd done a heck of a lot of work. I mean, mm. she condensed her talk, and I think this is probably where the problem is of us picking up what she's actually about is yes. that she covered a uh, hundred and fifty page paper in Half thirty hour, minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. It's so it's just... uh, a tall order. Maybe we'll, we'll we'll leave a link to the paper itself, possibly in the. Yeah. Um, in the comment section below. But it's a synopsis of a synopsis, isn't it, really? Uh, yes, <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah. But, you know, there were trends in the data, uh, obviously, to do with uh, north, uh, north south burial and, and male female uh, propensities for being buried to the left or the right or east east west, that kind of thing. But I didn't get much more than that from. No. From her talk, un unfortunately. No. Yeah, it was the surprise about the cause <laughs> that we That's came true. away with. Yes. <laughs> yes. That is our confession. Yes. Yes. Next up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Colin Richards. Colin Richards. At the University of uh, Highlands and Islands. The Living Tomb, Fluidity and the Instability of Substances. Mm. Uh, do you know what I, I think we should probably say right from the get-go? Yeah. Colin Richards has got an impressive uh, CV, hasn't he? Huge, it? yeah. Um, yes. I mean, can't go into it all. He's another one of those archaeologists who has just done so much over so long. Well, as we were uh, just lo looking up, <coughs> uh, I mean, top line uh, co-director of the Riverside Project, the Stonehenge. The Stonehenge Riverside, Riverside Project, yes, which, um, yeah, as if that's not enough. Mm. Uh, but his whole thesis here, mm. I'm afraid I couldn't resonate with it at all. It seemed like a whole load of... This is this is art. This is poetry. In uh, this is archaeology as poetry. What did you call it? Um, the uh, philosophical anthropology. Yes. Yeah. Or anthropological mm. philosophy. Mm. And um, Collins' thesis w is basically how uh, the the body, the interred body, becomes one with the tomb. Yeah. Really, so as the body decomposes and fluids seep into the stones, and is that it's about how the body becomes one with the tomb, and I'm just thinking. Uh, yes, and it was about surfaces <coughs> as well, skin, uh, the interpretation of uh, the boundaries between between one area between. and between yes, mm. between one area and another how in their shininess stones have an apparent uh, skin or could have and he was debating uh, the importance of that shininess to our neolithic ancestors and how they have, may have perceived 
those boundaries in a different way to what we do because those boundaries were very very important to them mm. uh, I'm not so sure <laughs> but it's also the fact that uh, I don't mean this in a totally dismissive way but it's also the fact that so many of these things are utterly unknowable Yeah, and to put so much research into something that is or to build a whole thesis on something that is unknowable. Mm. Um, I mean, one of the analogies made early on was we take something like a you know a, a flint nodule, which is that you know beautiful, or depending on what kind of chert, but you know you might have this lustrous black on the inside, but it's a white nodule on the outside, and perceiving that as a skin, maybe, mm. maybe, but to but to apply significance to something. I um, should also say, actually, something that we didn't say was um, Colin couldn't actually be there because of oh, the sure. storms and the weather, uh, so he couldn't come down from Orkney. Uh, so that his talk, his, his paper was presented by Vicky Cummings, who, I have to say, regardless of our opinions on, on the subject matter itself, <coughs> Vicky was a, 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 a very, um, a very good uh, speaker. Yeah, she yeah. was. She was, uh, you know, really enjoyed her talk, even though mm. I couldn't resonate with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and another pillar, another pillar um, of uh, the thesis was the, uh, the, the smooth stones on the insides of uh, tombs, uh, the splitting of stone to create a smooth and a, and a, and a rough side. Yes. Um, Do you know what? It's worth saying here that yeah. our friends, uh, Toby Angel and Martin, what's Martin's surname? I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry, Martin. Um, uh, who um, uh, uh, make modern uh, long barrows. And Martin is a stonemason of huge experience. Yeah. And Martin's attitude to that is, well, but no, that's just the way you use stone. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and uh, I think that the notion that uh, or deriving significance from just the way you use stone, uh, again, seems a, a, a leap too far. When there are plenty of practical reasons yeah. for doing things yeah, in, absolutely. in that way. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, I mean, you can't take the aesthetic out of it, uh, of course, it, it entirely. Um, but again, as a pillar of uh, what it was trying to transmit, it, I, I mm. thought it rather a bit weak, uh, to, to say the least. So, um, yeah, we're back, of course, to To Follow Me again. Definitely. Um, uh, which, of course, when you're dealing with the... Uh, uh, the dead uh, is an aspect that has got to be delved into. But his notion of um, tombs being a process and that uh, the, the thing of, of putting the dead in there so that they could be absorbed into the tomb... So the tomb as a, is an entity. Uh, uh, really? Is an entity that's in, in process of absorbing... The remains, the, the life, the energy, the life force back into the tomb, the earth, uh, etc. Mm. Mm, uh, you know, it's uh, it's an idea that one could easily dream up, but uh, supporting it through and archaeological having, evidence is another matter. And entirely. having said that, what do we know? You know, I mean, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but when so, we, but you know, as. Uh, you know, archaeology being at base, science based, mm. you have to go by what is most likely without mm. dismissing entirely mm. things that seem less likely mm. in the face of scant evidence. You, you who, have to... who, who was it? it? Somebody else during the day, and I confess I don't remember who it was, but somebody was talking about. Uh, when you put bodies in tombs, that in many ways you're keeping them away from... Uh, so that the people outside didn't actually have to get close to the utter disgusting rankness <laughs> of rotting corpses. Yes. Now, that, that to me is a much more plausible 
notion of you know mm-hmm. the, the function of a tomb. Why do we bury people anyway? Because it's disgusting to leave them rotting, um, even though you know some mortuary practices were all about leaving them rotting. Yeah. But in places that were removed from mm. the rest of society, so mm. you weren't faced with this rotting stench all the time. Mm. Um, and so yes, the notion of the putrefaction being this kind of poetic transition, I know I find that really yes. uh, a step too far. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we'll put a we'll put a the, the, the Colin. There is a video of Colin Richards uh, presenting uh, this paper or the related paper mm. on YouTube, and perhaps we'll put a, a link to that so you can mm. make up your own mind and put it in the in the mm. uh, description um, yes. below. He, he's interesting to listen to. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, it's just, make, you know, we just... Make no don't. bones about it. That's uh-huh. the I'm sorry, uh-huh. sorry. Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 but it was, a, it, was, it was a notion of uh, um, feeding the monument. Yes. It was a kind of shoveling the dead in to feed the, feed yes. the monument. And he did say something also about, was it, uh, about um, uh, separating the building of a monument to its... Uh, it doesn't become the tomb until it's built. And he was, he was something, saying something about the process. It's all a process, including the deposition of the dead, etc. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway. <coughs> so fluidity in everything. Yes. Was, he was trying to inject the idea of fluidity, I and mean, it's a different mindset. He was trying to, mm. uh, you know, uh, uh, mm. just tease out the possibility that uh, mm. n- the Neolithic mind had a very different concept of the process of change and mm. fluidity, and he was applying it not only to the body but also to the, the tomb, etc. Mm. And you know, so it was all a sort of a flow for the Neolithic people yes not so sure folks not so sure no never mind um <laughs> moving on moving on next up is um so i put my bit of paper away yeah rich folded it up nicely so i can't even read you the isotopes 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 mm-hmm. isotope isotopic approaches to landscapes of the living and the dead Rick Schulting, University mm. of Oxford. Mm. I know that we have a thing, you probably know we have a thing about um, isotopes. Um, I really enjoyed Rick's talk. And uh, it, it's that aspect of uh, when stuff becomes measurable. <clears throat> um, it's just fascinating that, um, uh, I mean, if you, don't, you know anyone who doesn't know, but basically the, the, the crux of this was about strontium more than anything else, wasn't it? You did yeah. talk a bit about the other uh, isotopes, uh, about other isotopes, but but so, what, them being nitrogen and oxygen, are they? Uh, you, in uh, use? Well, yeah, amongst others. I mean, yeah. But but the thing is that w- what's what you get from strontium, <clears throat> because element in rocks is taken up by plants. There's ten times more strontium in plants than there is in animals. But mm-hmm. however you ingest it. Uh, it goes into uh, the teeth and bones, yeah. and it stays there. Uh, yeah. So, in teeth, it, hang um, about. Sorry, we, we, we have a, to we have interrupt. A, the a dog, dog wants to uh, say something. Yes. What is it? Yes. Like Hello. Do you, do you want to come up here? Because we're not going to play now. No. No. Never work with dogs and animals. You can tell he's gone quiet now. And as soon as we look back at the camera, he will start talking again. Um, so what was I saying? Yes. Yeah, so there's, there's um, ten times more <laughs> ten times more strontium in plants than there is in uh, in animals. But however you take that in, whether it's through eating um, plants or animals, it's fixed in teeth and bones. So. If you measure the strontium in teeth, then you will uh, you will get uh, where that person was because strontium is measurable. It's like a fingerprint across the planet almost that that you can tell where that substance came from. So you can tell in teeth. You can tell 
when those teeth were developing, where they were developing. Mm. So you can tell where, where a kid grew up. Mm. And then with bones, it has to be cremated bones because if you bury a body, then the bones will mm. continue to absorb strontium from, uh, from the environment over time. Um, so it has to be cremated bones to, uh, to stop the uptake. But you can tell where somebody spent the beginning of their life and where somebody spent the end of their life, within 10 years of their death. Um, and some fascinating stuff coming out of that. The fact that uh, cave burials, the people in cave burials, had much less animal protein in their diets than the people who were in the more formalised burials. And mm. West Kennet was an example that he gave. So you've got this big burial. Much more animal protein in those bones. Uh, and that, that potentially, and again, you can't say for certain, but that does really give you a real social difference mm. between uh, the people here yeah. and the people here. Um, mm. You know, you know, was it a a thing that you know like you know did the the powerful people eat more meat did they um yes i'm sorry about my dog sorry you can probably hear the grumbling because we're not paying attention to him <laughs> and the reason he's in here is because if he wasn't in here he'd be scrapping at the door to come in yes so uh, uh yeah and he doesn't want to appear. Doesn't want to appear on camera. He got quite cross about that, so he's just grumbling on the floor here. <laughs> he's doing some yoga now. Uh, <laughs> um, what else was particularly interesting about the, 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 this? Is stuff that it, it might be common knowledge to uh, to a lot of people. Oh. Certainly wasn't for me. That um, so you've got two sites close together in Wiltshire. You've got West Kennet and Windmill Hill. Now, I didn't know that in West Kennet there were not enough skulls in relation to the rest of the uh, skeletal remains, and in Windmill Hill there was an excess of skulls in relation to the, uh, to the skeletal remains. So that kind of implies that, that people are kind of gathering up body parts, you know, skeletal remains generally, and uh, and just kind of splitting them up, we'll put these over here and we'll put these over here, without actually having any particular concern for whether it was a whole body that was being transported. Yeah, yeah. I had n no knowledge of that at all. I found mm. that really interesting. Mm, mm, mm. And, that, I mean, that's, again, that's an incidental uh, detail from Rick's talk, but I found that well, it was one, like of, one of many, I mean, because there were examples from all over the country and, uh, mm. and Ireland of the distinction between uh, uh, meat-eating in certain parts and, uh, mm. and more plant-based uh, diets in others. Mm. Uh, he's comparing, uh, coastal <clears throat> comparing coastal areas of... <laughs> oh, no, you can't have it. <laughs> Go on. Uh, Coastal areas of Scotland uh, uh, to I can't remember now, but the detail of which we cannot get into here because we, we can't convey it, you mm. know, without presenting uh, visually the results and the, and the data. And this is about data. Mm. That is that is the thing. Um, uh, so we can't, you know, throw numbers at mm. you. All we can give you is a sense that these techniques. Uh, tease out of the data, uh, tease, mm. tease out of the earth and, and the bones and uh, etc. Et um, fantastic um, uh, details to be able to discern another aspect of what was going on mm. uh, way back then. It's amazing when you, when you actually had the, uh, the strontium values and, uh, and uh, Rick put up uh, a few graphs where showing how the different burial types related to the different strontium values, and some of them were really marked, weren't yeah, they? Yeah. You know, complete distinction, no blurred edges at all. It was just no, they they ate a lot more meat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It didn't interestingly have uh, a lot to say, although he has been because he is the man as far as. 
uh, Strontian uh, analysis is concerned, it didn't have much to say about migrations um, mm. uh, it, with respect to uh, Durrington Walls and st uh, stuff that went on at Stonehenge in this particular talk. It was, no, uh, yeah. no, true. I suppose, you know... You've it was much more of the social distinction thing between possible meat-eaters and uh, yes. there the, the being a, a class distinction. But his talk was so stuffed with information that yeah. I don't know how he could have uh, squeezed anything else into <laughs> anything it. Anything really. else into it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, fascinating stuff. <coughs> so, like you said... I'd, don't think there's anything more really to relate uh, to that. Uh, uh, not really. I mean, that's yeah. uh, uh, again without actually giving you kind of spurious figures that won't mean anything to you. In, in as an notes, aside, so. this is not the last you'll be hearing of Rick Schulting. We've lined him up for an interview. We have. Yeah, you will be able to do a proper deep dive on this stuff yeah. and, and and bring you um, a proper report um, yeah. right from the horse's mouth. Uh, about what all this stuff means. And not only Rick Schulting, as an aside, we should uh, say we did uh, some a little bit of networking. We did do some networking. We've got, a, we've got a, a f actually a few interviews that are going to come out of this, which is rather exciting. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, uh, do you know what? I, I don't feel inclined to give everybody's name right now, just in case... Um, <laughs> sure. Well, do you know what I have to say? Many as, a, as a complete aside, there's a, there's a chap uh, called uh, Mike Allen who I have mentioned before, we have mentioned before. Um, Mike is, is one of the archaeologists who uh, <coughs> will, will take, for example, snails excavated from a henge ditch and from the different species of snails in their locations in the pits be able to give you a reconstructed environment for the period. It's an amazing science. Now, so, we've been trying to get Mike for uh, a little while now, and I thought that he uh, was just probably not interested in uh, in doing an interview because he hasn't replied to emails. Well, he was there yesterday, and we, you know, we've had dinner with him uh, before. And uh, and so he said, I, I said to him, I, I don't want to be pestering you, but do you want to do the interview? And he said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he just hadn't been getting the emails. So I don't want to give other names, just in case we have the same Abs problem again. Absolutely. You know. absolutely. Um, but we have got, uh, you know, half a dozen interviews to come out of this. It's, yeah, it's great that people were enthusiastic about it. After lunch, we moved along to the Isle of Man. Yes, which we, we're ex did. We were very excited about. But uh, potentially, but but uh, let down a bit, I think. Yeah, I think we're we're probably doing um, a disservice, uh, there. Chris, a disservice. It's uh, Chris. oh yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Chris Fowler. Yes. Um, uh, where, where well, are he, we? He's he's part of a team of three, isn't he? Who are the rest? That's of the... right. Uh, mortuary practices and monuments in the Neolithic of the Isle of Man, beyond the megalithic tombs. Mm. Uh, is yes, Rachel Krellin, That's a good Manx name. Mm. Uh, Chris Fowler himself and uh, Michelle Gamble. Is, mm. uh, so yeah. it was Chris that was. Uh, presenting uh, the paper and uh, yeah I mean uh, Mike was born in the Isle of Man uh, I know it very well and, um, and so we were quite excited about that it, it's one of those things that Chris was giving this uh, synthesis of the data that they've uh, that they pulled yeah. together. I mean, they which, have. It's not just that they have been doing a lot of work. Huge to be, amount of work. Massive amount of work. Yes. To be fair, yeah. uh, and excavation, which has yeah. resulted in some remarkable yeah. finds. Yeah. Um, There's just not much that we can actually relay about that because in terms of a, a kind of a synthesis of, yeah. of what's going yeah. on. Um, but Chris also has. Um, I will say. <laughs> I will say it in this context because they're yeah, yeah. not doing him a disservice. Chris um, uh, has uh, uh, enthusiastically said that he'd be um, up for an interview. Yeah. So he can tell you firsthand about uh, uh, about a lot of their findings because it it's getting into specific details about different sites. It just it, you know it wouldn't really mean anything. I'm sorry, you're you're battling bravely. I know, on. I know. Uh, uh, He's uh, just against this uh, ghastly little animal down here. I will we'll have to. Uh, record uh, this aspect of what's going on at my feet so that you've got actually got a frame of reference for what I'm having to deal with here. 
Right. Shall we? Oh, we'll take a, we'll take one of those old BBC breaks, with, shall we? And uh, just to have um, thirty minutes of the thirty seconds of the dog playing with his wolf and getting cross with us for not joining in. <laughs> I just I, I I can't do I I can't do him justice. Uh, it was the information. It was uh, it was just so much information that was very site specific, and uh, is is that fair? I can't, yes, I, don't feel I mean like I can generalize the, the couple either. of surprises. I mean the thing because we know the Isle of Man and we covered it. We we went there in Standing with Stones mm. and we did uh, good. Uh, you know, we honoured those monuments well mm. and pointed out their, you know, their distinctive features mm. uh, uh, and that they do have dis uh, distinct Manx qualities, if you want to call it that. But also what I didn't realise, and that is something that has come out from that talk, is that the material culture is is distinct as very, well. Very, very distinct, isn't it? Yeah, that's a good point. I good didn't point. know there was yeah. such a thing, I didn't know there was such a thing as a Ronald's Way jar. For example, no, I thought Ronald's Way was an airport. That was. <laughs> <laughs> See, I didn't know a, a Ronald's Way jar um, looks like a straight-sided beaker with a very curved uh, mm. bottom, uh, quite uh, quite distinct and unique to the Isle of Man. But hump scrapers, humpbacked scrapers. Yes. Yeah. Um. Uh, oh. Well, it, to, I mean, all I could see was the image on the screen yeah. and what looked like, uh, you know, a very rounded end to a, a scraper that perhaps fit well in the palm of the hand or but something it, like it, that. But it seemed to be a thing. It was a yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, distinctly Manx. Yeah. So and that's interesting because when you think, you know, the, the sites, many of the sites on the Isle of Man, the megalithic sites on the Isle of Man, are very, very distinct. You don't find uh, sites like it, particularly Mull Hill down, yeah. uh, down south, you don't find uh, a matching one anywhere as far as I'm yeah. aware. They had uh, and, uh, uh, fancy you designs. Know, some, some quite a, a lozenge-shaped uh, spearheads, arrowheads, whatever, and... Uh, um, um, an an RT, RTB axe head is a particular form of axe heads, apparently. What does RTB stand for? I don't know. <laughs> RTB. Oh, wait a minute. Um, it's got something to do with the blunt arse of it, hasn't it? Tumbleweed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's going to annoy me. Yeah, yeah, OK. Let's not get hung up on that, no, shall right. we? So, but that was a nice thing to take away, that, that, uh, that apart from the monuments, that the uh, material cultures is also distinct. And, uh, but apart from that, it's a matter of um, uh, the results of uh, the archaeology that they're doing, um, the, the detail of which... It's hard to convey because Can't convey. It it's needs, enormous uh, illustration and uh, yes. and the, apart from the distinction of those things, there's not a lot much to to report. It is mm. uh, yeah uh, tomb types and dates and uh, you know what was recovered from where, which uh, you know it is um, it, we can't really convey anything more than that. Really, no. no. I, I'd say I, I do still like the the jet necklace that was found on the Isle of Man. That's actually jet from Whitby. Mm. Uh, that's interesting. It was you know, nice to see that again because it's, it's a stunningly beautiful thing. Mm. Mm. Showing imported stone. Mm. But it's worthwhile pointing people in the direction of having a look at um, uh, the Isle of Man and and seeking out. Uh, the monuments that are on the Isle of Man because do you know what gets forgotten is that for a small island 30 by 15 roughly it's got some kick-ass stuff on it breathtaking you, you know Castle in Ard is uh, massive King Ori's grave is is massive and rivals quite a lot of stuff that's on the mainland yeah here. Um, yeah and the point you made in in the film uh, that uh, you know what size of community 
Um, what for, for Castellinar? Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, it's massive long barrow. Yeah, um, and and the uniqueness of um, Mill Hill, um, mm. uh, yeah, as, as well. But go and have a look. Find out what you can about um, uh, the Isle of Man stuff on the Isle of Man. Mm. Uh, if you like different stuff in a different uh, place. Yeah, got to be said, the Manx Museum is well worth a visit as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was suggesting that they go as far as to get on a plane or a boat and actually yeah, go. I would. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a beautiful place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can't recommend it highly enough. But then I'm a bit biased, maybe I am, <laughs> as a Manxman. Mm. Duncan Garrow. Duncan Garrow, I, again, I really enjoyed his talk. Yeah. Uh, Duncan was a very compelling speaker. Neolithic grave goods and the complexities of mortuary material culture. Mm. Uh, do you know what? My big takeaway from, uh, uh, from Duncan, uh, regardless of, uh, of all the rest of it, which is ver really interesting stuff, but the big takeaway from him was Duncan was making the point that... We get so fixated on stuff, on the stuff, you know, on the impressive bits and pieces, instead of looking at and interpreting the whole thing, you know, the, a, a holistic approach to excavations. And, and it's a very good point, yeah. isn't it? You know, that, um, uh, that uh, somebody else made a comment, and I can't remember the chap's name, not one of the speakers, um, who 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 agreeing with Duncan and said that? Uh, but if you take, for example, the forecourts of uh, of many of the long barrows, that the amount of broken pottery that's found in a forecourt, and yet we obsess <coughs> about what we're digging out of the actual burial, what's in there with the dead, and it's therefore making the, uh, the distinction of, you know, we get so obsessed about looking at the stuff that relates to the dead as opposed to what the actual site can tell us about the living and all that broken pottery outside is about the living and it's, you know, the holistic approach that tells you about society as opposed to a dead body. Mm. Interesting. I'm just illustrating the scene with a cutaway of uh, the dog trying to bury his bone in my armchair in the corner there. This is a slight distraction. Oh, are you looking at Duncan's graphs? Yes. yes. I'm looking at uh, Duncan's graphs. Mm. The question at the top of one of his slides, can I read it? Can, can I read it? Mm. Can we move from an impressionistic stroke assumed understanding of change through time in prehistory to a real one? Mm. Do you want to read that again? Can we move from an impressionistic stroke assumed understanding of change through time in prehistory to a real one? Mm. And it, it is such a valuable distinction. You know, we, uh, the, the, you know, his point about the impressionistic aspect of uh, our conclusions. Yeah. Uh, yes. Just, I don't know, how do you synthesise all that information? But it, it, oh, he just, <coughs> his graphs were... There was, a, there was another one after that. Well, that, 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 I think... Yeah, I, this, this is so often happens, is that uh, the standouts for us from a particular talk may not be the fulcrum or the point of the particular talk that was hmm. given. So... Um, you know, little things lot, awake our brain yeah. cells and say, "Oh, that's interesting." Yeah. You know, not necessarily what he's trying to convey as being interesting. Yes. However, uh, I'll put this on on screen. Uh, is a, a graph. What you can see on screen now is uh, the numbers of grave goods through time. I uh, don't know if you can read the scale at the bottom, but the uptick, that flat line bit, is the Neolithic, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, uptick takes place uh, into the Bronze Age. And what we didn't realise, there's a bit of flat line after the Bronze Age, between yeah. the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, yeah. in terms of grave. Uh, that that um, is fascinating. Yeah, that really surprised me. Really mm. surprised me. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the... Uh, uh, interesting 
things that he was talking about was at Isbista. Yeah. Where's Isbista? That's the Tomb of the Eagles. Isbista is the Tomb of the Eagles. Isbista is the Tomb of the Eagles, yes. Because he was talking about uh, all the pottery that was in the tomb, that was taken out and burnt and put back in the tomb. Mm. I didn't catch up on that, too, so I, I can't... Uh, it's not something I caught from it, but... Um, well, it impressed me and I wrote it down. Yeah. So I'm hoping that I haven't got that wrong. Mm. No, have confidence in yourself, man. <laughs> no, that's right, that's right. I wrote it down. Um, and, uh, and so immediately you get the... Well, what's that about, then? Take the pottery out, out. burn it, put yeah. it back. Mm. What? Yeah. Um, again, so much unknowable stuff, mm. but uh, it's just... And uh, did he point it out in the talk? But it's another aspect of this whole thing, of the sequence of, of grave goods and what we can, what we read into them at first take and what is actually really going on. I mean, Isbister, Tomb of the Eagles, so named, is a prime example because <laughs> the eagles that the the the, mm. uh, um, the the eagles that give the tomb its um, name uh, didn't arrive in that tomb until five hundred years after the the after initial the, after burials those. had taken yeah. place or yeah. the interments had taken That's place. That's true. The human quite, remains quite unrelated to the people. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what were they doing? 500 mm. years later. It looks like a completely different process, thought mm. process, mm. <laughs> or, you know, or it, understanding of nature that it, goes behind that. But, you know, if, if we're going off on that, so away from Duncan's talk for a, sec uh, for a second, but but it's kind of relevant in that here you are, you've got the Tomb of the Eagles, where the eagles have got absolutely nothing to do with the, the bodies the of the people. Burial, there, yeah. Yeah. And then just up the road and round the corner... You've got the Tomb of the Otters that is given its name purely and simply because when they excavated it, it was full of otter crap because otters had taken up residence in the tomb. And, and so, you know, we have to be so careful about, uh, you know, uh, applying our romantic notions to something because, yeah. you know, I mean, through time, what, if nobody qualifies that about otter crap... And in a hundred years' time, people are talking about the Tomb of the Otters. They will be thinking that it relates in the same way as the Tomb of the Eagles, when it's just yeah. based on crap. Well, uh, in the, well, Tomb of the Beagles will stick, won't Tomb it? of the Beagles will stick. I can't remember what the real name of uh, that to tomb is. It's closer to Mays Howe than... Uh, what's it called? I can't remember. Yeah, Tomb of the Beagles. To be fair, that it wasn't based on... Beagle crap. No, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. There was actually a Neolithic doggy in there. Mm. <laughs> yes. But for what purposes? For what reason? Uh, who, who can who can tell? So, yeah, I mean, Duncan's, <laughs> as you say, Duncan's thing <coughs> is about separate. Am I reading this right? It's about separating our interpretation of why. Uh, and uh, certain grave goods would be associated with certain uh, burials, that we need to tease them apart, perhaps, um, and not create so much meaning from our point of view uh, about he, them and, he and was, draw back a little bit. Uh, his, his big takeaway was really that we obsess about the impressive things. So if you take something, oh, yeah. you know, oh, well, look at this that came out of a tomb... And uh, and that we we give it meaning and importance when in actual fact there there's, might be this wealth of stuff that is in itself less important apparently, but that might give you so much more information about the the, the tomb and the burial itself. Um, I think you know that's really what he was getting at. Yeah, I think. Cool. Well, that's a good takeaway. Uh, that's a good takeaway to have. Mm. Yeah. Um, excellent. We enjoyed his, his very much, talk. Uh, very much. Uh, very much. 
Uh, he's um, doing an interview too. <laughs> <laughs> Having said, we won't. Yeah, I know. Say. I know. Can't help it. <laughs> yes. Uh, while I'm thinking about it, um, we we'll apologise for the interruptions from the dog, and uh, and uh, if it appears that this is a bit thrown together, forgive us because we are working under a very narrow uh, time schedule here because uh, Rupert's got to go back to home. Well, uh, yeah organise himself for catching his flights which means he's leaving here tomorrow morning so oh, yeah. we're going to ha- we're having to deal with what we we're given here as far as environmental concerns <laughs> delivering our um, report here so apologies for the distractions <laughs> and uh, My interruptions fault. it's his fault My fault. Uh, time's fault um not enough of it fault mm. Saren Griffiths. Saren. <laughs> Do you know what? Saren was a breath of fresh air. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I say at the top, this was something that she just threw in well towards the end of the talk, but I just uh, loved her approach. But she said, stuff happened in the past. Get over it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, she has very much a get real attitude to all of it. So she and her team is it, is it her team? Is she actually there? Uh, well, she's with Fionn, up there? Uh, She works with Fionn Rails, but um, there was a number of people on the excavations up there. It's all on Brinkethley Lee on yeah, Anglesey. Yeah. The title was no. The Island in the Dark Grove, which is what Brinkethley Lee means. means. Yeah. The Brinkethley Lee Landscape in Context. Um, what can you say? The excavation work that's been going on up there is amazing, and you know we mm. were aware of the complexity of Brinkethley the itself. You know how it did, had developed over time, and the information that had come from previous excavations. But what they've been doing in the last couple of years? Oh my goodness! The sites that they've found around uh, the uh, Brinketti the itself. How many different sites uh, have they excavated there? Oh, I, I lost the. Well, I amount, think the main but... centre of excavation has been the the, uh, the 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 monument to directly to the south of of uh, yes. as we know. I don't know if they've actually excavated some of the others. They they have been detected. That's what I mean. They've been okay. detected. So yeah. so, uh, but it was. Uh, I mean, there were just like half a dozen that were all. Yeah. You know, pretty yeah. right there. We're talking about a complex again. <sighs> yeah. Um, Again, so much stuff. So much stuff. Um, Why? Well, my big takeaway from her talking about uh, Brinkethley V, and, and uh, Brinkethley V wasn't the only thing that Saren talked about. We'll get on to the, the next thing uh, later. But uh, there seems to me to be um, a little movement or a sea change in uh, how the archaeology is being uh, approached um, now. And this is very much all included in the excavation is very much examination of the surrounding landscape mm. um, not just digging up stuff but appreciating what was around there what's the geology around there mm. what would uh, neolithic eyes be looking at when they look from this place what they, would they be appreciating in the landscape that brings them to this uh, particular place mm. And um, as some of you will know, we brought attention to the uh, the standing stone uh, that's in the central chamber of Bring Kethley, the uh, who made standing with stones, and you know created a little bit of con- little, little bit of a controversy uh, mm-hmm. in uh, pointing out that it looked identical to a piece of. Um, foss- a, 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 a fossilised fossilised tree trunk, tree trunk. Mm. Um, we didn't know it at the time uh, this piece of gneiss <laughs> it's blue schist blue which schist. is a very very particular and comparatively rare uh, mineral mm. rock um, and, and yes it was the fact that every single book we had ever read all said a carefully dressed pillar of stone 
Mm. And that's the one thing we saw straight away when we saw where we looked. It was that wasn't carefully dressed at all. It was naturally like that. Mm. Um, so why had everybody said this? But uh, so having found out, and it, it was Fionn Reynolds who uh, who's on the Brinkethley the uh, dig. And it was Fionn who contacted us. It was years after the event. When did she contact yeah. us? Three, two, three years ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, and she was explaining she'd been there with a geologist for the, and it was the first time a geologist had actually said, "No, oh, this is," um, and identified uh, the rock type, so you could understand how it's formed. Won't go into that now, but uh, how you can see how something could naturally appear to be like a fossilized tree trunk. Um, but uh, it it the point about these things really is that. It doesn't matter whether something is or isn't a fossilized tree trunk. The point is that if it looks Look like, like it looks like wood made of stone, that would have been magic to our ancestors. This thing between worlds, mm. and and one of the other interesting things that Saren talked about was yeah. there were various volunteers and students on the dig, and she said she got a phone call from one of the people working there who who rang her up and said, uh, you, "You've got to come down." My hands are golden, and she said, "What?" And this person said, "No, my hands are golden." Uh, and so it's, uh, Saren uh, whizzed over there, and it's all the mica in the uh, in the uh, the rock and the substrate there that that your hands actually gleam gold when they're covered in uh, uh, in all this just. Stuff that's coming out of the uh, coming yeah. out of the ground. Yeah. Now that can you imagine that going back to, you know, thousands of years ago, when that was actually what was this stuff? They're yeah. gleaming in the landscape, that, and that's, that's why they put the stones like that because oh, it must have been amazing. And that, that's the shift, including this stuff in the archaeological record and making sure that people are aware, because if that occurred as magical to our ancestors, mm. then, you know, no wonder uh, Brinkethley the, is where it is and where, why a complex maybe uh, grew up ar around there. Mm. Um, there, was an, there was another uh, aspect of it, and I think uh, to, uh, to do with the, the rock in the immediate vicinity, how it would have occurred in the landscape, that was quite unique. The actual uh, blue schist that we're talking about actually came from a few miles away. Yeah, uh, uh, d down down the road. Um, it, we we should reach a point where we're no longer surprised at <laughs> how far people were prepared to carry very heavy lumps of rock. Yes, shouldn't we? Yeah, but it, yeah. it never ceases to amaze. But yeah, mm. and of course, what um, um, Saren said uh, at the opening of, of a talk. I mean, it, it's an interesting sentence. An interpretive revolution would require more than a change to the sequence, but also a questioning of whether that structure is appropriate in the first place. Mm. And she's talking about a temporal structure, i.e. the th three age, yes. you know, yes. division. Yes. Or, or for, if it, you know, the if it, Mesolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age, or Neolithic, Bronze yeah. Age, Iron Age, these, yeah. And it, it is such a massive point to make, isn't it? That mm. we, we, we have these names that we apply to things. And so it makes us compartmentalise things as opposed to placing something maybe in a transition or something, you know, going back to Colin Richards' fluidity, you know, that, uh, that, that there is this continuous progression and yet we put things in these brackets Mm. And those brackets might be preventing us from seeing things. Yeah, yeah. And it disallows a lot of the, the, the noise that's coming up in the, from, from the new science. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of noise in that, which is a conf in conflict, perhaps, with the kind of uh, archaeological culture, our own, you know, 20th and uh, 21st century archaeological culture that may be need, it's being disturbed by the new stuff that's coming out of the new science 
And I think that Saren was arguing for, you know, the broad inclusion, of, you know, which is what they're doing, taking more of the surrounding landscape into account, not just focusing on the monuments, but in the whole, in the, in the breadth of, of stuff uh, mm. around that monument mm. in order to understand the story behind that monument mm. and how that monument may have occurred to people mm. as a way of understanding rather than... I, uh, I, I very much got the impression uh, that, uh, that Seren and Duncan particularly are very much in this thing of of, of what can the dead tell us about the living as yeah. opposed to just looking at the dead. Yeah. And that for me is, you know, that, that's the big underline at 17 times yeah. point. I, I first came across this last year with Martin Carruthers on the uh, Cairns Brock dig mm -hmm. that, I, that I went on, how much care and attention was, and it was, this is novel, uh, care and attention was going uh, into, uh, con not concentrating on, but, but including what is going on in the landscape uh, around, mm -hmm. and, and how the monument itself, rather than being a deposit of stuff in and of itself and contained with itself, but it is a, a gathering point, a kind of filter, a sink for the surrounding landscape. Mm. So, so, so that the monument becomes a lens through you, which you view what people were up to. Mm. Of course, the, the, the wonderful thing about a brock is that uh, it is a place for the living. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. It is true. Mm. Yeah. So she had a lot to say about bring carefully the, and again because of the detail of it, we can't really sort of bring it together and match it together do justice. into a kind of synthesis that wouldn't do justice to. But Siren's doing an interview as well. But <laughs> 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 yes, and in, yes, indeed, uh, we will look forward to that. But the latter half of Siren's talk was uh, about her project. Um, Mm. Um, project Time, that's a good title, isn't it? Mm. Which I presume is her she's, project. She's got proper budget for it, too. She said. Yes. Uh, I've got a million pounds. Oh, I don't know how these things work and where they work. Well, how extensive <laughs> but it it's may a be. Big. I, 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 I don't know how expensive it is to do half of that work. Yeah. It's not going to be cheap, is it? N not at all. Uh, mm. it, it is massive by the sounds of it. Mm. Um, and... Like the Gathering Time project, uh, I, it's about revisiting, gathering new data, dates mm. all together mm. to really um, get, out, get out of this straitjacket of the, the structures that we've imposed on time itself. Do you know, I, I, I think it's worth making a point here, because it's something that we tend not to uh, take on board particularly. And that's, you know, we've mentioned at odd times, you know, about, you know, a lot of these sites were only excavated, you know, 60 years ago, 100 years ago, before any of our modern techniques were available. I think it's important to look beyond that and say, well, hang on, so much of that stuff that we still take the information available from excavations that were nearly a century ago, yeah. in many cases, and it's only now that we have, you know, all our digital capabilities that we can actually collate information and extract um, more information from all of that. Uh, you know, that that is so new. Mm. Uh, it's actually staggering how much of a sea change that is yeah, yeah in terms of you know the potential for our <clears throat> learning moving forward yeah 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 i'll i'll read you what it says on the slide about um, mm. project time um she says analysis of all evidence for 2000 years of irish and british prehistory 3500 to 1500 bc in ireland and britain use time to structure narratives not culture historic approaches, i.e. Beaker and late Neolithic, early whatever, blah, blah, blah. And so to transcend our fractured narratives of particular cultural complexes and produce a detailed historical account for the first time. 
That's a fascinating twist, isn't well, it? She, I thought it was funny when she said, let's take the pre out of prehistory. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, there was a part of me that said, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I completely know what she means. It's, um, it's, a, it's um, a confident, written narrative yeah. of the history of yeah. Britain and Ireland, yeah. uh, of, of, of the prehistory mm. of Ireland and Britain, yeah. Working across Britain and Ireland to identify regional trends and traditions, overlaps and tensions, hiatuses and rates of innovation and change. Mm. I mean, mm. massive. It's huge. And inspiring, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I tell you what, personality-wise, she's the, she's the girl for the job. Do you know what? I, I have to say, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't happen that often, but uh, one of the thoughts that just hit me very hard during Seren's talk was, I so wish you'd been one of my lecturers. <laughs> just so inspiring, really. Mm. Yeah. Takes no prisoners. And all those no, <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. But that's what you want. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. So, yeah, we'll look forward to... Um, we will very much uh, look forward to talking, having a chat with, with her. Sarah. And she Good also uh, she asked us if we wanted to go up and see stuff on an angle seat, didn't she? I mean, yeah. the straight answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens there. Mm. Death and burial at mm. the time of Stonehenge. Mm. Mike Parker Pearson and Christy Willis. Yes. Christy Willis is a name you may uh, think you've not heard of before, but in one of our earlier podcasts, she got big mention because mm. Christy Willis was the, the girl responsible for sifting through the remains dug up from Aubrey Hole number seven. Yes, she was. Uh, f what, 500,000 yes. pieces of cremated bone and... Yes. Yeah. Just how do you even start that? Uh, you know, hat, yeah. hats off to Christy. Yeah. For <laughs> it's a bonkers thing to have done, really. Yeah. Uh, mm. um, Mike Parker Pearson. Yes. Um, what did I say he was talking about? <coughs> Death and burial. Um, At the time of Stonehenge. Have I got some kind of reference? Let's let's start from a, a transition from collective to single burial. Yes. Um, I don't know if there's anything particular we picked up uh, from the talk about that. We know that's what happened. Yes. Ivor was associated it with the, with the influx of uh, beaker culture mm. um, uh, and, and how you know the Neolithic population was gradually replaced by uh, incomers, um, genetically speaking. Um, and the influx of a, of a very different culture and a very different attitude to death and burial. Mm. Uh, it's profoundly different. It's not, you know, just... It, it's hugely different. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, you know, again, we, uh, we have a situation right here, right now, of just how long do we want to talk about this? Because there's <laughs> just so much information. Yeah. Uh, um, I, we don't need to go through it chronologically. The thing is, the massive takeaway for me... Yeah. Huge that I didn't um, didn't appreciate at all before. hadn't heard before. Was uh, uh, Christie was talking about the amount of burials they found where it was just a handful of somebody, just a handful of cremated remains yes uh 20 grams was the average wasn't it something like that think, 20, yeah. Yeah. so so basically it was it seemed to be that the relevance was not about the whole person it was about you could take a handful of somebody and take them somewhere so um so it was a token yes it was a token deposit. of that person yeah uh now that's just such a big thing in my head yeah such a completely different way mm -hmm. of looking at uh, treatment of the dead. And here we're talking um, about the earlier practices. Mm. And these are the practices to do with, um, well, 
Stonehenge particularly because we're talking about deposits in the Aubrey holes mm. and in the uh, and in the, the ditch uh, around never realized this that uh, so many of the deposits were actually very partial deposits as we're saying token deposits from mm. the individual that can be as little as one percent of the skeleton remains uh, mm. represented mm. Uh, in 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 a deposit so we're talking about uh, causewave enclosures again, we're talking about um, hengiform structures. Uh, I didn't realise quite how many, you know, circular ditch and bank or circular enclosures that there were, which you could, if you took the fact that there were burials within them, you could infer that they were cemeteries. Mm-hmm. Uh, apart from apart from anything else, this thing of matching burial to circular enclosures—that's a new one on me it, at such a scale. It's not just Stonehenge; it's going on all over the place. Mm. Uh, I didn't uh, I didn't know that. What does it say? Yeah, circular cemeteries, in other words, mm. uh, ditched enclosures, stone circles, formative henges, and uh, round burrows. Um, yay! Uh, and the fact that so many of them were single, uh, mm. uh, isolated cremation deposits. Mm. <coughs> Another interesting thing for me was she talked about one burial, uh, cremated remains, where there was a whole person, cremated remains, uh, and one finger bone from a child. Mm. And, and so you had this thing of, yes, technically that's two people, but... But actually, you've got a burial that happens to have a spurious bit of somebody else that accidentally got scooped in there. Mm. That would be my interpretation anyway. I, yeah. you know. and, uh, and so, uh, again, it, it raises that question of how are people actually going about that collection of remains? Mm. The fact that you've got contamination mm. of another... Mm. burial. Mm. I found that intriguing. It wasn't a distinct point that she was making, <coughs> it was just one of the things that um, yeah. kind of turned a light on with me. Yeah. So, yeah, the other headlines were, were shift from disarticulated bones mm. um, to articulated uh, skeletons in the later uh, burials. Decline in... in Decline in inhumations and increase in cremation burials. Mm. Uh, circular cemeteries, as we said. Decline in cave and rock shelter burials. Uh, absence of cremation burials. Absence of cremation burials in caves and rock shelters. So, mm. yeah, all sort of little different trends there kind was, of working against each but other there, there there was over also time. The. Um, uh, the significantly greater proportion of female burials. Yeah, in that, certain areas. Yeah, that's that was right. intriguing. Oh as yes, well. and it, I, I, that's something that leapt out at me that it seemed that in the uh, circular cemetery burials and in causewayed enclosures there was a much higher proportion of female burials than in a long barrow, for example. Where mm. males uh, had propensities. So, propensity, is that the right word? Had, yeah, it'll um, do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, the, the, things like that, which again, we can't do in a deep dive on here and, and sort of extrapolate. Uh, extrapolate. Extrapolate. Like extrapolate. I mean, that was another word. <laughs> was, You're uh, wrong. Meaning. Me <laughs> New dictionary. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> meaning from um, yeah well it wasn't during um, Mike's uh, talk that uh, Richard Bradley who was sitting behind us who's a well-known archaeologist uh, piped up about um, how I think it was I think it was uh, during uh, Duncan Garrow's talk talking about another aspect that we're missing from the excavation of uh, long barrows particularly is that the forecourts have been not been uh, examined properly for remains well, of... yeah no who was that i think that was in in duncan's talk because yeah, it, that's um, what because, I'm saying. yeah because he was talking about the amount of pottery that's found in the forecourts in particular yeah 
Uh, well, yeah, it's a very good point. But it's back to what we but were it's saying. But it's a missing because people, you know, historically have been concentrating what's in the burial yeah. and missing out on, well, the stuff in the forecourts and what's going to tell us what was going on with people. Yes. The living. Well, that was the point we were making before. It's yeah, about yeah. what can the dead tell us about the yeah. living. <laughs> But as but my thought was about the uh, articulated and disarticulated bones in long barrows and the ideas that we have about them being moved around because mm. we know that they get mixed around a bit and I had this idea in my head of how uh, you know Uncle Fred and Uncle Jim are sort of at certain times of the year, annually, some of the priests go into the tomb, take out the bones, they sort of mm. uh, have a little ceremony with them, dance about a bit, <laughs> take some drugs perhaps, have a merry old sing-song, and then, you know, put the bones back. What could possibly go wrong in terms of <laughs> not mixing them up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Going back to the living... Yes. One of the things that I got from it, which is not even really about burials, and, I, and to be honest, I'm not sure where Mike was getting this, you know, conceptually getting this from, yeah. but he made the distinction that marriage within a community was about retaining control of the land or the ownership of the land, and marrying outside of community was about the herd and the importance of the herd. Yeah. Um, so it's the the different social practices. Mm. Uh, you know the implication there being the difference in those social practices. That's that's intriguing. Uh, you know, and I'm left with a uh, you know faced with my own ignorance again. Really. Yeah, I didn't quite get where he got like you the the, the marriage or inside or outside the community. Mm. But but it was also in my mind what I recall from it is it was relating to um, multiple burials as opposed to single uh, burials mm -hmm. um, as as well. Um, <coughs> um, because what we've got, we, the thing we haven't mentioned, I don't know if uh, he mentioned this in passing, is that during the Neolithic, which kicked off um, bringing um, uh, you know, pastoralism uh, into the part of the Neolithic package. But in in Britain, there was a shift back to um, farming being based around cattle rather than uh, crops. Yes. Uh, and and I, what it kicked off in my mind is, is if there was a shift from that related to the shift from uh, collective burial where your, your, your activities are concentrated around, around a community mm -hmm. as opposed to the more uh, uh, venal things of, uh, <laughs> uh, of going off and hunting where the individual is celebrated. That's, that's what clicked in my it's mind. It's an interesting concept, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, more. That, and that, I think that was the note that I made. I don't know if it was that... that that may be my brain kicking off rather than the point that Mike Parker Pearson was trying to make. It's still an interesting point to make, though. Yeah, yeah. 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 As <laughs> ever, it's just left us with an awful lot more reading to do. Yeah. Uh, Basically. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll do our best to uh, put uh, links to uh, supporting material that uh, may help better illustrate some of the things that we've taken away, um, mm. uh, the people involved and the concepts involved. Um, hopefully, I know there's one at least uh, of the full papers out there, uh, and if we can find more, we'll put links uh, down below in the description. Mm. So, with that, what um, what else can we say about this? I tell you, for me, I'm, I'm asking you, but before I forget, I will just say say this: that for us, we've been to two conferences now, and it's not just for us about learning about the archaeology and, and taking from uh, academics at the top of their game, at the top of their career, you know, trying to relay it back to you. But for us, it's learning about archaeologists themselves. 
and you know the culture of archaeology and uh, who mm. relates to what and uh, mm. uh, who's top dog and who isn't and uh, those kinds of things yes so and, that's and, also part of the fascination and quite how much argy bargy goes on yeah uh, yeah um, uh, which is a, a friendly argy bargy it has to be said respectful argy yeah. bargy but um, yeah it's not a profession to go into if you take things personally. Definitely not. Good <laughs> lord. No, I think a delicacy <coughs> would uh, would crumble. I think science of any kind, that, you know, where, where you you do a lot of work and then you come forward with an idea, you've got to be prepared to go down in flames. Perhaps. Do you know what? This is probably an appalling analogy to make, but uh, but it's like. Strictly come dancing. Yes. Right? You get people who absolutely bust their asses for a fortnight to get a dance right, and then they go to their viva <laughs> <laughs> in front of this panel who go, that was absolute rubbish. <laughs> 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 Utterly crushed. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I can only apologise for that, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, we really did enjoy our day. Uh, yeah, we did. full of surprises, mm. um, and uh, I hope we've managed to convey at least a few of those uh, to you right now. Mm. Um, we don't know when we'll next be reporting back on a conference, do we? Because uh, I don't think there's anything coming up in this country. No, particular. there's nothing imminent. But um... uh, We'll seek out individual talks when we can, mm. um, and uh, I, I have plans to be back on... Uh, uh, Tim Darville's dig um, on a long barrow in the Cotswolds uh, mm. in June, so maybe hopefully I'll be able to report a bit better back on that one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've been invited to other places which we, we have, can't really talk about been, yet. Yes, no, we can't really, but we've been invited to, as you said, to a couple of different uh, digs going on. Yeah. Um, so that's a watch this space. Yeah. Don't 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 wish to sound cryptic, but um, yeah. but, uh, but we have to at this stage. <laughs> and to yeah. pat ourselves on the back a bit, you know, we have uh, elevated our profile amongst the uh, <laughs> the high and the mighty. <laughs> uh, mm. So uh, in that respect, uh, a good job uh, done. These badges, I have to say, these work wonderfully. Yes, they were coveted. Uh -huh. Actually, they yeah. were coveted. Uh, more on that anon. Mm. So we'll, with that, shall we say bye-bye? Have you got anything well. more to say? No, not really. I think we just run the risk of boring people to death, don't we? Yeah, so yeah. it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye, it's good, from, goodbye from me. And it's yeah. goodbye from the, uh, from the dog. Yeah. Who, now that we've finished, is asleep. <laughs> we hope we haven't sent you that way. <laughs> <laughs> Till the next time, bye-bye. <laughs> Hello, Michael Bott here. Thank you for watching this Prehistory Guys show. There's loads more to watch, and you can get to some of it on this playlist here. If you'd like to receive updates about when we publish new content, hit the subscribe button, and you can unlock even more content by becoming a Patreon supporter. Hit this button here to find out more about that. See you soon.